Let's look at Mark chapter number 11. Thank God that we can be in a different place. We don't have to be in the same place every year just because of tradition. But I'm just in a different place this year on this Palm Sunday. I appreciated the way that you this morning responded to the Word of God. I appreciate what God spoke to us. And I want to look at the same passage of what happened, but in a different gospel. And I want to look at what God can speak to us here on this Palm Sunday, because God's already doing that in our midst. I'm not going to be lengthy. I just want to be, I just want to look tonight. I want to bring us back to the same place of this hungering and desiring and thirsting. But maybe with a little more focus this evening upon Palm Sunday and what Christ and the Word of God speaks to us. For centuries, we've celebrated the Sunday before Easter being that triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And you can just almost in a route where he's going from Bethany to Jerusalem. You would go beside Bethany, an ancient church, and uh, it is believed that close to there, there is a tomb in which Lazarus has been raised from the dead. Not many days prior to this, they remember this magnificent miracle that Jesus resurrected a man from the dead, who surely by now he stinketh. And then you would go uh, uh, from, from Bethany where the tomb of Lazarus was. You would, you would come uh, to where uh, some commemorate Jesus riding upon the back of, of that donkey. Uh, uh, then you go to the Kidron Valley. And then you would lead into the Via Della Rosa. Uh, the path in which he took. And so as we look at that, um, that, that time in which we celebrate Palm Sunday, this advent of everything that's happening during what many refer to as a holy weekend, I'm okay with using that terminology because it is a very sacred time as we look at what Christ has done for us. We don't, we don't segregate it to, to one week a year, but this is something that we remember every day of our lives as believers, what Christ has done for us. And so in Mark chapter number 11, we start off reading, the Bible says, and when they came near to Jerusalem, which I just walked you to, and to Beth, Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent forth two of his disciples. And we said this morning that tradition says that this is John, this is Peter, the Word of God does not. But tradition would tell us that. And many folks feel strongly upon that. And, and said unto them, Go your way uh, over, uh, into the village over against you, probably uh, Bethage, and, and soon as you be entered in, you shall find a colt tied well, whereon never man set, yet had never ever been ridden before. The Bible says that they, Jesus spoke to him and said, Loose him and bring him unto me. If any man say unto you, Why do you do this? Uh, uh, because it was going to be the case. Jesus already prepared them for what is lying ahead. I think it's a reminder that moments in our life that transpire the ministry of God's Word, the ministry of a service, always prepares us for things that lie ahead. Amen. It doesn't happen by chance or just circumstance, but God orchestrates it. The Bible says, say, uh, uh, say ye that the Lord hath need of him. And I want to stop right here for just a few moments. And I want to think about this before we move on any further because this is where we are in our service. Does God have need of anything? God doesn't need anything. God is God. He doesn't need you or I to do anything to keep this world still in motion. God doesn't need us for His existence and His being. He will always be. He will always be holy. He will always be loved regardless. God does not need us. 
Amen. But what was happening here is God doesn't need anything. Amen. But God wants certain things surrendered unto Him. Amen. He doesn't need it, but He wants it. God doesn't need us to worship, but He wants us to worship. God doesn't need our obedience, but He wants it. Amen. Uh, God doesn't need our lives. God doesn't need our time. God doesn't need our time. But He certainly wants it. And so the message of Palm Sunday is this, is that God does need. He wants you. Amen. He wants everything about your life. He wants surrender of your time. He wants surrender of all the kingdoms of your heart. Amen. He, he wants everything about you. God desires it. He does not need it, but He wants it. Do you know what God wants? wants that time of day where He communicates with you. God wants that time of day where your praise is an anthems to Him. Amen. He, he wants it. Amen. And he, he, he does need it. It won't stop His existence, but He speaks out. I need you. I need your heart. I need your time. I need your surrender. I need your obedience. Amen. The message of Palm Sunday is we have a God who loves us so much that He died for us. And He wants us. Amen. Who are we that God would want us? Amen. Go and tell them that I want them. I feel like I'm a Peter. I feel like I'm a John. Amen. I feel like I can lose you tonight to say the Master has need of you. I'm just a messenger. Amen. God has need of you. And the Bible says, and straightway immediately, he will send him hither. Isn't that interesting that God had already orchestrated, God had already designed that he had need of, of this cult. We read this morning in the text in Matthew that there was a cult and there was a mother. Amen. The cult had never been written upon. The mother had been written upon. Amen. He wanted both of them. Both of them are what went. Amen. And here he is. And, and they saddle up this up. Amen. And, 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 and they bring it to Jesus. It's interesting that this animal had never been written on in the Old Testament. You know, there was those sacrificial heifers, that, 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 that uh, red heifers that had never been used for plowing. It was sacred, uh, really, in its purpose. But donkeys were different. If you were, uh, you know, one thing that I like, uh, and let me just add a little bit of humor in here tonight. My wife always says, you can get another car if you want. I'm like, I'm not getting rid of my truck. I want this thing, you know. It's, it's important when I want to haul, when I need something, I don't need to pest anybody else. Amen. I have it. It's my truck. I like it. Do you know what it was like in the Old Testament having a donkey? It was like having a truck. It was. I didn't come up with it on my own. Actually, I read it in the commentary. And I said, I understand that. I can relate to that. It's more than just having a car. It was like having a truck. Amen. It was it, 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 it was a it was a status. It was it was a, a, a workhorse. And Brother David, it was like the, the Old Testament Toyota Tacoma. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So here it is that 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 in this case never been written written upon. It was set aside for sacred use. God wants folks to be obedient and set aside and surrender for sacred use. Amen. God wants your obedience. Amen. God, God's desirous. Amen. That He has need of us. That we set aside ourselves to be sacred. And we set aside ourselves to be obedient for His use. Oh, Craig, that's powerful for me tonight. Then God can sanctify and set me aside as sacred because He wants to use me. The Bible says, and when they went their way, they found the colt tied by the door without a place where two ways met. And they loosed him. Amen. And they loosed him. The Bible says 
that they found the coat by the door where it was tied, where two ways met, and they loosed him. There are two ways. Amen. There is our way, and there is God's way. Amen. There comes a point in our life where the master gives a call and says, I need you. The forks in the road is this. Will you do your own way and your own thing? Amen. Or will you surrender to the call of God that I want you for a sacred purpose and a sacred use? Every one of us in here, we have the ability, amen, to be set aside as sacred. And there's a fork in the road, amen, whether we'll choose to spend our days and our time and our talent, our surrender and our obedience to the desires of our own heart, or we'll say, God, I'm going to immediately be loose and I'm going to follow you wherever you want me to go. You ride on me, Jesus. Amen. You be the one who has seen. Amen. You be the King of Kings and you be the Lord of Lords. I surrender it all to you. Amen. So in the situations of our lives, we stand at the forks in the road of the day. Will we set aside for holy and sanctified? Or will we do it our own way? And certain of them stood there, said unto them, What are you doing, loose the colt? Jesus already told them they're going to be questioned. Jesus already gave the information. And tonight, God has all the information. God knows our needs. God knows our questions. But God has already made a way that says, if you'll surrender to me and follow me, I need you. You may say, look, in my brokenness, in my struggles, in my own anxieties, and in my own worries, Yes. God's already answered the question. God wants you. I believe Paul Sunday is about knowing that the Master has need of us. Yes. And God's already prearranged and pre orchestrated that He has a plan for our life without any questions. And the Bible says. And when they said unto them, even as Jesus had commanded, they let them go. Amen. There is a privilege when we lend our obedience to the voice of God. Amen. But David, there was no questioning. There was no fighting. Brother Justin, there was no argument. There was just simple surrender because God had already spoken it and had already had prearranged it. Amen. Do you believe that that is your life tonight? That God has already spoken it? God has already prearranged it? That He has need of you? Amen. So the only thing is, is to let go and be obedient to the voice and the plan of God. The Bible says that they brought the cult to Jesus and they cast their garments upon it, and he sat down. This is the beginning of the triumphal entry. Amen. It is, it is made mention there in, in Zechariah. Let me turn there. In Zechariah chapter number 9, verse number 9, the Bible says, prophetically speaking of this triumphal entry, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shallow daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes unto you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon the coat of the fowl of an ass. Amen. Here it was already prophetically given that they should be anticipating that this is the King of Kings and this is the Lord of Lords. Amen. And immediately, yes, they accepted and they gave him that, that as I preached this morning, they gave him that false coronation to a true king. As he came in, and they spread their garments in the way. And others cut down branches off the tree and strawed them in the way. And they who went before and they who followed cried, saying, Hosanna 
Amen. Save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And blessed be the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. All these things are lining up with, the, with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as they looked at Jesus as the king and as God and as humanity. They all line up. And the Bible says that, uh, that, that there Jesus says as he enters into Jerusalem and, and the temple and he looked around right about the setting. And, and, and the Bible says that the next Next day he got up and he looked at the fig tree, Brother Doug. There was a fig tree and it looked beautiful, Brother Josh. It looked like it was ready for harvest. And when he went, there was no fruit on it. And immediately he cursed the tree. Amen. It was because it didn't bear fruit. Amen. It was because he was showing them something of a greater uh, 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 knowledge. He was showing them, Israel, you are the fig tree. And you look good. And you should be bearing fruit. But you're not. And so I curse you. It wasn't a curse forever, but for that generation. Because now the gospel is going to be spread to the Gentiles. Amen. They're going to be, or they're going to be sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. The fig tree would, would, would once again blossom and bloom again in Israel, but not that fig tree. And his disciples came by and they saw that immediately it was dried up and they questioned. You know, we have a responsibility tonight that God has called us to be obedient. And God has called us to follow at the fork in the road. But God has called us not to look good, but to bear fruit. This Palm Sunday, what fruit <laughs> is being bared in your life? What's the fruit? If Jesus were to pass by and look upon your life as the fig tree, would it just look good with no fruit? Or would he say, oh, there's the fruit. There's love and there's joy and there's peace. There's temperance. There's long-suffering. There's fruit of the Spirit being born in the life of this believer. Amen. This is what I came to earth for. This is what I gave my life for. That they may bear fruit. We you know as we go on through that he comes to the temple and then he comes in and he sees that there they are. They've made it a den of thieves and he overthrows a table. Because Christ wants His house to be the house of prayer. If I could wrap all this up tonight, I'd just simply say, Palm Sunday is this. Is that Christ calls us to follow with obedience. That He meets us at the fork in the road. Is it going to be His way or our way? Amen. He gives everything that we need for all the logistics of the rest of our life to line up. But when we meet Him at the fork in the road, there needs to be simple obedience to know that the Master has need of us. Ellie, do you know that the Master has need of you tonight? Sister God, the Master has need of you. And Josiah, as young as you are, the Master has need of you. Not that He needs any of us, but that He wants us. How phenomenal is that? And so this morning, I ended our service by having us hold our palm branches and wave them and say, save us. And if we were saved, it was a sign of surrender to say this. And I'm sorry if you were here this morning, but let me just share for those who weren't. It was easy for them to give a coronation to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because they thought that he was coming in to overtake the Roman government just like Maccabees had done years earlier. They thought that he was coming to bring them deliverance, but his kingdom was not a kingdom that was being built on earth. He was building a heavenly kingdom. He was not coming as the lion this time, but he was coming as the Lamb of God. He will be back as the lion. Amen. He's coming back to set up his kingdom. But this time, as they give him the coronation, amen, they were looking for a king who would do so much more than, 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 than what uh, they even realized. He was meeting more than let the eye. He was meeting the spiritual needs of mankind. 
So Brother Doug, it was easy for them to give them a coronation. But afterwards, it was just so frustrating for them. They had thrown their coats in the way. He had rode over it. There were thousands upon thousands of people that tread upon their coats. And then they had to go home with coats that were dirty, coats that were ripped, and they forgot about the King of Kings because they were worried about the details of their own life. And the details of their own life became their king. Are the details of our life our king? Or is Christ the king of kings? Lord, I am thirsty. I am hungry. Christ calls at the fork in the road. Sister Beth, if you would come back, and Sister Holly, if you would come. I want us to sing that again. The forks in the road. The master cries. I have no fear. There's two ways. There's his way and your way. So tonight, I wonder if you would have fresh commitment to say, God, here I am. I know you don't need me, but you do need me because you want me. But then he doesn't need me to make the sun come up tomorrow morning. He doesn't need me to do anything. He's God. But yet, Sister Linda, he needs me. Because he longs for a relationship with Jesus. As he comes by, I want him to find that I'm surrendered to go in the direction he wants me to go. I want to be the donkey that says, here I am. Take me and use me. He didn't ride the mother. He rode the colt. The mother was Israel symbolic of who should have accepted him and had relationship with him, but they rejected him. And then he goes by the fig tree. I don't want him to come by my life and just say you look good, but you have nothing, no fruit. But I want to be surrendered to the Spirit of God that's greater than me. Where I say, God, I want the fruit of your Spirit to be producing in my life. I want when you come by the house of Miracle and Out Church that you find that we still are a house of prayer. If you read on down, he talks about prayer and how that we can pray and say to the mountain, be thou removed. And he talks about uh, uh, how that prayer changes things. But it's as we pray according to the will of God. When we meet him at the fork in the road, we say it's not about my will, but God, only if it's your perfect will do I want this. And I'm surrendered to it. So tonight, as Sister Holly sings, I want us to sing. But I want us to step out of our pews. I'm sorry, I'm just doing things different today. But I want us just to get around the front. If you're able to stand, that's fine. If you're ready, we'll just find a seat. But I want us to say, God, here I am at the fork of the road. I'm surrendered. God, here I am. I'm the tree. I want to blossom. God, here I am. I'm the church. I want to be melted for my prayer. If you're really hungry and thirsty, would you come this Palm Sunday and meet with God? Come, lift up your hands and surrender. Hallelujah. Amen.